Okay, class, let's continue with our Chapter 10 video lecture with Part 2. And we've already talked about in Part 1 the modified accelerated cost recovery system depreciation that's pretty much mandatory. And if you want to claim even more deductions in the first year, you place an asset into service. Maybe you want to use this Section 179 deduction. Up to $510,000 of tangible personal business property can be deducted in that year you place it in service so you cannot deduct real estate you cannot deduct intangible again the dollar amount for 2017 is up to 510,000 but we'll see a phase out of this amount on the next slide I believe this uh, section 179 is an election yeah you don't have to do it but if you do it's based upon each year so maybe if you don't do it this year you can do it for next year for assets you place into service next year here it says that the makers depreciation will apply to anything that you don't deduct under section 179 we also will see a few slides from now a 50% bonus depreciation that is applied after deducting the section 179 expense and then thus anything left over will use the makers depreciation rules to be able to claim 179 the asset has to be at least or here it says more than 50% business use so if it's 100%, no problem. All of it will be um, eligible for the 179. But if it's um, less than 50% business use, 50% or less, then none of the costs at all is subject to 179. So the business portion would have to be um, de deducted under the maker's rules. There is a limitation uh, or here it says that you cannot use 179 for rental property we're not just even talking about the real estate for the rental property we're talking about anything that's depreciable in the rental property like the furniture like the fixtures like appliances whereas if it's purchased and used within a trade or business that would be eligible for 179 you have to buy this asset not uh, get it any other way here especially through a related party also the asset can either be old used or new and that's also true for the makers rules to depreciate can be used or new we'll see though that the bonus the 50 percent bonus depreciation those assets have to be new the first owner If you take a 179 deduction, your front-loading deduction, and then in a future year you convert the property to personal use, you probably have to recapture some of this 179 deduction as ordinary income in that year you convert it to personal use. Here it says that if you buy uh, a lot of assets that's depreciable for as personal tangible personal property maybe you can't use this 179 election especially for very big companies here it shows you the phase out range if you buy more than two million five hundred forty thousand of assets for the year you cannot elect to deduct anything under 179 if you have less than two million thirty thousand of tangible personal property placed into service during the year then up to that five hundred ten thousand can be fully deductible here you can see the phase out range between the two equal to the amount that is the maximum deduction so dollar for dollar over this initial limit it starts to reduce this uh, maximum amount deductible of course for many small businesses Nowhere do they come close to this dollar amount, let alone buying this amount for the year. Another limitation is that the 179 deduction cannot 
create a loss. Here it says that you can take a deduction up to the taxable income before deducting that 179 expense. So here is all our income, and we minus out the deductions that are um, not including the 179. And here's our taxable income or net income. So the maximum amount you can deduct as a 179 is not just this 510,000, but this taxable income not taking into account any 179. Now you can still claim all of your uh, amount up here, up to this maximum amount, but the maximum you can deduct in that first year is to reduce the taxable income down to zero. And anything that you don't use, you can carry over to um, the next year, let's say 2018, where this is uh, 2017, subject to the same income limitation for next year. So again, two limitations, a, a dollar amount that you can claim, and up to deducting uh, the amount of taxable income, not reducing it below zero, not creating a net operating loss. Anything that you try to claim, the dollar amount that you cannot deduct, is suspended, and you carry it over to the next year, subject to the same income limitation rule. So here is an example. We have Tanya. She has $552,000 of tangible personal property. That's equipment. Uh, a seven-year life. Use 100% for business, so we don't have to allocate any non-deductible personal use. And she's electing to claim the maximum uh, 179 deduction. So the extra, that's 552,000 minus the 510, here that difference of 42,000 is now going to be uh, deducted, depreciated using the maker's rules. Now keep in mind we haven't talked about the 50% bonus depreciation yet, but this possibly half of it, 50%, could be claimed under bonus. And then the rest, claim under makers. But in our case, the makers is what we're going to do for all the excess 42. So if you look up on the seven-year um, uh, column in the depreciation for half-year convention that we learned about in part two, you would get this depreciation rate, and you multiply it by the excess over that 510,000 maximum. That comes out to a regular maker's depreciation of $6,002 plus the maximum uh, section 179 deduction will give you a total deduction of $516,002 for the year you place this asset into service and then next year you get to deduct this uh, 42,000 times the, the next year percentage again looking it up in the depreciation half your convention uh, for seven year Let's talk about bonus depreciation. Uh, this is not a slide that you would see in the regular PowerPoint file. I had to insert it. But for 2017, the rate is 50%. And it's been going, uh, that was higher in past years. And in 2018, I believe it goes down to 40%. In 2019, I think it might go to 30%. And after that, it may disappear, unless Congress changes its mind, which has done quite a bit in the past few years. So, as I mentioned before, for tangible personal property, you use Section 179 first, up to that 510,000 maximum limit. And if you have anything left over, excess, now you apply this 50% bonus on that excess not on the total original uh, amount. And then, after deducting this 50%, if there's anything left over, that excess, you use the regular maker's rules that we had, um, had um, demonstrated, illustrated back in the part one video. This has to be, though, for bonus now, new, 
not use tangible personal property. Also, we'll see, I think, in the, uh, another slide, something called qualified lease improvement property. Also, be eligible for this 50% bonus. Example, we have Polar. They have 635,000 of qualified tangible personal property, that seven-year pro um, property. And we're going to deduct the maximum amount for Section 179, leaving us, I think it's 125,000 excess. So 50, uh, let's illustrate this out, 635,000. And then uh, that's the total cost. And 510 is the uh, Section 179 limit. And then the excess is 125,000. We take 50% bonus. Remember, this has to be new property. So half of it is 662,500. And then leaving the other 50%, 62,500. Um, using the maker's depreciation. So you would look up on that half year convention table, the seven year column, the first year, here it says the rate is 14.25%. Uh, to nine percent so you come out with uh, fifteen thousand three hundred six dollars so when you buy this asset in that first year you get 510 section 179 deduction 62,500 bonus depreciation and 15,306 uh, makers depreciation so one two three all in the first year then next year you take this cost and you multiply it by next year's percent okay until it's all used up in seven or eight years so qualified leasehold improvement property uh, would be eligible for that 50 percent bonus depreciation Typically, improvements to a building, a leasehold, is real estate, real property, subject to a longer depreciation, depreciable life. But here we can cut it down and take the expense a little earlier. It has to be for a building that's older than three years. And the improvements, this leasehold improvements, have to be made either by the landlord or the tenant. It cannot be uh, structural. It cannot make the building bigger. It has to be internal improvements. It, it, here it cannot be um, common area improvements. It has to be improvements for a tenant, either paid by the tenant or paid by the landlord. Things like putting in internal walls, non-supporting walls, uh, putting in counters, putting in uh, electrical to accommodate that tenant. And again, because it's real estate, typically you have to depreciate it over a long life using the straight line method. But if these improvements are made for non-residential property, like an office building, then we can use the bonus method, 50% in the year that it's placed into service. And then any excess, not depreciated straight line over 39 years, this is the regular life for non-residential property, but we get to um, depreciate it over a shorter 15 year period. That's any excess over the bonus. In addition to the modified accelerated cost recovery system that sets the assets life into certain class lives, that sets the method of depreciation generally to be uh, the double declining balance method or the 150% uh, 
uh, declining balance method. If you want to extend the de deduction over a long period of time versus trying to accelerate it into the earlier years, you can use this alternate depreciation system method and pretty much have a life that's probably closer to the real physical life of the asset. And you would use the straight line method and not these accelerated methods, but you still would have to use the mid-month convention for real estate, um, the half-year life for most of the tangible personal properties, or the mid-quarter if you have more than 40% of the tangible assets uh, in service in the last quarter of the year. Now, uh, certain taxpayers are required to use this uh, ADS method if the asset is outside, located outside of the United States. Um, but otherwise, if the asset is located within the U.S., this would be an election to extend the life, to use straight line method. And you would do this by, let's see if the next slide clarifies it. This would be applied to each year for the whole class life. In other words, you just cannot pick one computer out of this class and say, I'm going to use ADS. All of the five-year property for that year would have to use ADS. In the case of real property, you can apply ADS. Again, basically, it's already straight lines. So you're extending the life probably to something more like 40 years. Um, you can do it by building, by property for real estate. Um, and, and the main reason why it says here that people would like to extend their life is because they already have enough deductions for the current year. In fact, they already have net operating losses, a topic that we had covered in a previous chapter. Keeping in mind that net operating losses can be carried back two years to, to offset taxable income in the prior two years and carried forward for the next 20 years. Um, I, I kind of disagree about trying to postpone the deductions because if you cannot use your net operating loss already in the next 20 years, something's wrong with your company. Yeah, You're not a, a, a going concern. So no matter if you claim the deduction now or later on, probably you're not going to get any benefit if you're a company that's not going to survive in the next 20 years with no profits. Um, Let's move on to the next slide, which is another topic, trying to limit the depreciation deductions for certain types of properties. Specifically, it's um, tangible personal property that has some um, nature to be used for personal use or maybe even for recreation purposes by the employee or the owner of the business. So here they give examples of cars and maybe computers, maybe entertainment devices, video recorders. Everybody uses their phone, yeah, they don't use a recorder anymore. Uh, unless you have a GoPro. Let's see. And, and the limitation is that in the case of cars, it's going to be a dollar limit of depreciation you can claim each year. Or in the case of um, assets that have a mix of both business and personal, possibly if you don't exceed uh, more than half of business, the life will be extended for the business portion. Yeah, more if you fall below 50%, really 50% or less than uh, business use then this listed property limitation will kick in, basically using a longer life and probably going into the straight line method. So here's the, the, the cutoff, yeah? It has to be more than 50% to have the regular rules we've been learning so far. And that business portion will use makers, possibly eligible for Section 179 and the bonus. Now, if the business use is equal to or less than 50%, the business portion, you have to have the longer life. You have to use straight line. You, there is no 179 and no bonus depreciation for that business use less than 50%. 
So one of the listed properties is automobiles. I'm not sure why they use the word luxury. It's not really luxury. It's just the rule for automobiles. If you consider a $20,000 automobile, luxury automobile, well, the IRS considers, considers that to be luxury, at least in the case of listed property. Okay, so you still calculate depreciation using the maker's rules, but then you compare it to a dollar limit that's changing each year. And of these two amounts, you take the smaller of the two. And that's what you get to deduct. Keeping in mind that if you have a mix between business and personal use, you would have to reduce the regular depreciation and this limit for the business portion. And then you take the lesser of the two. Or really the lesser of the two, then you apply the business percentage. You just don't apply the business percentage to this amount and compare it to the regular limitation, yeah? Both have to be uh, reduced by the um, personal use portion. And that's what this paragraph says here. Yeah? If it's not 100%, you apply the business percentage to both the actual cost, depreciation, and the limitation. Um, bonus only available. Section 179, only available um, possibly with a, a dollar limitation. Well, let me take that back. Probably no Section 179 for luxury automobiles. Possibly a $8,000 bonus limitation for um, uh, luxury automobiles. And again, there's still another limit dollar limitation each year on top of that. So here is the limitations by year in Appendix C, Table 6 in Appendix C. So if you bought your car, even in the current year, 2017, the maximum depreciation, regular depreciation, is uh, 3160 there is another uh, 8,000 bonus that you can tack on to that. This is the 50% bonus to raise the maximum to this 11,160 for the first year. Then, um, again, you first calculate your depreciation using the regular MACRS. Then you compare it to this limit here. Keeping in mind, you have to reduce both by the personal use. So next year, if you bought your place your auto in service in 2017 and 2018, here's your limit with no bonus. Remember, bonus only applies to the first year. Let's take a look at an example. We have Phil. The cost of his automobile is 60000 here in 2017. And he uses it for business 80%. And it says here that's 80% for the rest of the life of the automobile. Uh, if for some reason the percentage goes below 80%, there may be some depreciation recapture. Yeah. So it's kind of a easy example to keep it 80% for the whole life of this automobile. So what we get to do here in the first year is claim a 50% bonus, and that's uh, half of the cost, 30000 leaving the rest of the cost to be depreciated using makers for this year and future years. So in the first year, the five-year column, the rate is 20%. So adding all this up, the total regular depreciation is 36000 And if we compare that with the limit that we saw on the previous screen, this first year limit of 11,160. And of the two, we take the lower and we apply the business percentage. Yeah. And here's how much we get to deduct in the first year for fill. The next year, again, we use maker's depreciation on the remaining costs 
times the second year rate for uh, five-year property to get the regular depreciation compared to the second year limitation that's uh, this amount here of the two we take the lower and we multiply it by 80 percent business use and we keep on going with this pattern the thing is the 80 percent of the cost of the car is still going to be business but it now will take more than five or six years to try to depreciate the full 80 percent um, the remaining 20% will never be deductible as depreciation. And that's uh, the whole cost is being kept track here of what has not been deducted. And you get to deduct the remaining 80% either as depreciation over the years or deduct it when you sell it, when you get rid of it, which is another topic for another chapter. So you want to get away from this depreciation limitation why not just lease your car if you remember in your financial accounting classes there were things called capitalized leases and operating leases where you get to deduct that uh, rent expense versus treating it as an asset that's depreciated and financed with a make-believe loan and uh, interest expense well, in the case of taxes, we just treat it as operating lease. We deduct the rent payment, the lease payment. But because of it not being fair with the limitations we just saw for depreciation, the tax rules say that we got to reduce the lease deduction by something called an inclusion amount. It's more like calling it income, except now all we're doing is reducing the lease payment deduction. So the way you figure out this inclusion amount is to take a look at IRS tables just for this situation. You find the value of the car in the year you place it in service. And in the first year, let's say it's between 56 and 57,000 value when you first put it into service. You're going to have to reduce your lease deduction by $73 this year reduce your lease deduction by $160 next year and so forth. Yeah, that's to even out the limitation for depreciation here with a reduction of the lease uh, expense deduction. Still automobiles, but this time we're talking about automobiles that weigh more than 6,000 pounds. The previous automobiles we're assuming was less than 6,000, more of a passenger type automobile. Now we have passenger type, probably SUVs that weigh more than 6,000, like the Hummer, like uh, Ford Expedition and Chevy, I think it's Tahoe, Tahoe, yeah. And they have different limitations. Uh, you can take section 179 here this is an old limit you probably can deduct up to uh, 25,000 you can take bonus depreciation you can take MACRS depreciation there is no dollar limit like we saw we saw here yeah for the LA type uh, under 6,000 uh, pound cars Okay, so that's for really operating type trucks and really big SUVs, especially the passenger vans. Now, I, I hear there's like a lot of doctors buying those big trucks. Yeah, the only people they, they drive around is themselves. And this is the exceptions we just talked about. Okay, let's go into amortization of intangible assets versus tangible property that we've talked about in uh, past slides in the previous video. So we uh, classify our intangible assets into these categories. And most of them have assigned internal revenue code sections. This is something you have to actually identify on the tax return under which section you're going to be amortizing your costs. Um, probably the, the, the the main one I see at least is this one here yeah um, 
maybe this one. We try to avoid this as much as possible. It, it could be avoidable. And here is something that you see most times when you when you buy another business, maybe even when you start up another business, Goodwill. So let's start with that one. So Goodwill is when you buy probably another business, and here's all the assets you're buying from that other business. So you have to identify, you're buying it as one package, but you now have to identify specific assets and allocate costs to them. Things like the property, plant, and equipment, including land and building. The land, of course, you can't depreciate, so you try to reallocate as little as possible to that, getting a friendly appraiser. Or maybe uh, inventory of that going concern you just bought. Maybe even accounts receivable from customers to owing the old business. So you try to identify assets to allocate this total cost you paid here. The costs you cannot identify, the items you cannot identify that you paid extra for is goodwill. Now keeping in mind a lot of service type businesses have clients, existing clients, they have uh, patients, they have members and, then, and that's the really the big asset maybe they have. Not all of this hard stuff, yeah the equipment. So here we identify a value possibly to that customer list that's going to be amortized. Um, if you're a franchise, I keep on forgetting who's the franchisee and the er, but anyway, you have you bought the permission to operate a a Dunkin' Donuts, a McDonald's, you know, and you have to pay an upfront cost for that. That's an intangible, like like a license that has a, a, a shelf life. But you're going to amortize that cost. We're not talking about the royalty cost you have to pay every so often. That's an operating cost. But this is the upfront cost. Or well, here, when you bought this asset, the old owner, you told them, you don't go into business uh, against me. That's a covenant not to compete. And you pay them extra for that. You're going to have to amortize that asset that you just paid for. Here, it's going to be um, 15 years. And we'll talk about selling assets again in another chapter. Well, let me point out this. It, uh, a goodwill asset, the ones we saw, is something that you don't create yourself in running your business. Generally, you buy it from somebody else. If you create it in your own business, you probably already deducted the cost as an operating expense. Research and development costs, just like the financial accounting rule, generally we deduct it right away. But you can elect to capitalize it. And if you do, you get to deduct it over five years. Computer software, this is getting more and more um, easier to deduct. But if you buy the software with the hardware, you just depreciate it with the hardware. And that's a five-year life under makers. If you buy the software by itself, you amortize it over three years. Now, keep in mind, buying the software means you can do anything with it. You own it. But most times what you're buying is a license, which here it says you deduct and then you pay for it. Especially if you're paying an annual fee, the so-called software as a service. Yeah, it's just an operating expense versus an actual asset you're buying. So let's start up a new business. And it may involve uh, investigating whether the business is feasible at all. And once you identify it's feasible, then you have costs to open it. You're incurring it before you actually even run it yet. Well, this type of cost so-called startup costs, you can deduct 5000 up front. But this 5000 deduction starts to phase out if the total up, uh, the total startup expenses exceeds 55. It phase out when you reach um, 50 and dollar for dollar, it starts to phase out. So if you have more than 55, all of that excess has to be capitalized and amortized over, I think this is 15 years here. 
So not startup, but organizational expenditures, especially for forming a partnership and cooperating a business requires stuff like accounting, legal fees, filing with the state. All of that cost has to be capitalized, amortized um, over 15 years from the start when you start running, uh, operating your business. Again, keep in mind the section number, yeah? This number has to be uh, entered on the tax return, the section code number. Uh, last type of cost recovery, which we don't really see in Hawaii, is depletion. So here is the cost of buying the depletable asset, buying the right to mine, buying the land that you're going to drill an oil well, buying the land with standing timber. And that cost now allocated to the resource is going to be depleted using the units of activity method. You're, you're, you're depleting actual costs. But an alternative to, to, to deducting the actual costs is to take a percentage depletion allowance. So in our textbook, I believe there are certain percentages assigned to certain types of natural resources. So it's either 10 or 15% for oil. 10 or 15, the percentage is not a percentage of cost, it's the percentage of revenue. In fact, your total depletion deduction can exceed the cost over time. That's why it kind of subsidizes this industry. You're actually creating deductions from from thin air, from just selling uh, your regular your regular uh, product. Um, you do have to depreciate the cost of uh, setting up the oil well. This is the um, the equipment costs, the the physical costs, but other costs in developing that mine that oil well here called intangible costs can be deducted right away and not really added to the cost of the depreciable asset so you get your to deduct it up front in addition to any other operating costs you have you get to deduct it as you incur it let's take a look at the actual form we've been talking about all of these different types of depreciation or amortization deduction how do you report it on the tax return? It's reported on Form 4562. So we spent some slides talking about the Section 179 deduction. The limitation now is for 2017, 510,000 maximum. And if you incur over a certain limit of um, purchases during or Placed in service during the year, the, uh, the maximum starts to get reduced. There is also an, an income, let's see if I can find it, an income limitation, business income limitation. You cannot create a loss with this 179 deduction. You do have to identify the asset and how much of the cost you want to allocate to that uh, 179. You, can't, you don't have to allocate all of the costs for an asset. You can take part of the costs. So of course, the ones you want to allocate for 179 are the ones with the long lives. So the ones with the short lives, you're already going to get that cost deduction faster, right? So might as well deduct the ones with the longer life. Bonus depreciation, well, the 179 was part one. Bonus depreciation, that 50% bonus, is reported over here after claiming the 179 deduction. And part three, there's our MACRS deduction. Um, here in line 18 is for MACRS assets placed into service in the current year. That's 2017. Now, if you placed assets in prior years and have to calculate the deduction, depreciation using MACRS, you do it off of this form on a separate uh, worksheet 
probably in your tax software there is a schedule being kept track of for past purchases and you would just add up all of that prior year assets uh, depreciation and plug it right here as one number but line 18 is the current year um, placed in service assets like the short year lives you have to identify the costs the uh, recovery class life three five seven and so forth the convention remember every time you hear convention the special calculation for first or ha uh, last year the year of disposition here it's half year and the method makers generally is 200 percent um, declining balance versus 150 versus straight line here you can see straight line already entered because probably that's real estate with a set live here yeah and let's see I've never used this one before here's that listed property coming from the next page and then we take a total so this total may be reported now elsewhere in the tax returns if it's a a sole proprietorship probably on a schedule C if it's a, a rental operation probably a schedule E um, if it's a corporation probably on the 1120 or depreciation on the 1065 form here it says if you're a partnership or S corporation this uh, 179 deduction is not just limited here in dollar amount and and income but that limitations also are implemented at the partner or the S corporation shareholder level so it's not going to be deducted on the partnership or corporate return the 1120s it has to report it as a separate item so that's something you would probably learn more in the next tax class so make sure you sign up for spring for I believe it's the 419 class business administration 419 the prerequisite is getting a seal better in our 319 class so let's see listed property right here and that's calculated on the back side of the 4562 listed property Remember, this is the one with uh, limitations to automobiles and limitations if there's um, less than 50% business use. Here at the very bottom is amortization, where you put in a description, the year that you placed it in service, the dollar amount, the section number of the Internal Revenue Code you're amortizing it with, and the life using the straight line method to calculate the annual amortization that's totaled up and probably not combined with depreciation but reported elsewhere on the tax return okay let's stop here this is the end of uh, our chapter for depreciation and we'll continue with the next chapter next week